God King by Joanne Williamson. I'll begin with the prologue. 701 BC. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria and all the horde that is with him, for there is one greater with us than with him. Hezekiah, king of Judah, the Bible, 2 Chronicles 32, 7. In the days of Assyria's might, even Egypt feared her aggressions. Egypt was then ruled by Cushite princesses, princes, around whom one of them, Taharka, this story unfolds. It was children's nap time in the women's quarters, but the boy and the girl in the garden were not asleep. Hold him still, said the boy. The girl held hard to the injured lamb while the boy bound splints to the broken leg as they had taught him at scribe school. Where did you find him? he asked her. In the main kitchen, I was stealing a honey cake. The boy laughed. And you came out with this instead? They were going to cook him. Well, they won't cook him now. He laughed again, patted the animal, and watched it hobble off. You're good at this, said the girl, just like a doctor. That's what I would like to be. That or maybe a soldier. They say I'm good with the staff and the spear, and it would get me out of here. They gazed around at the high walls, hemming them into the garden with the lotus pool. I'd be anything to get out of here, except, the girl looked suddenly into his eyes, except that I wouldn't see you again. After a moment, he looked away. He caught a glimpse of a tall, handsome youth crossing the garden, followed respectfully by two priests. The girl saw him, too. At least, she said, I'd never have to see him again. You'd better get used to him, said the younger boy soberly. Some day. Never, said the girl. She rose. They're calling me. I'll have to go now. She walked slowly toward the door of the great house, where the head nurse awaited her, frowning angrily. The boy stared up at the high sandstone walls. A prison, he thought. It's like a prison, except that sometimes they let him out. Like tomorrow. The hunt. He brightened a little at the thought of tomorrow. He glanced toward where the handsome youth had disappeared around a corner. At least, he thought, I'll never have to be king. Chapter 1. Crocodile. Get back in the boat, Lord Taharka, back! You must be ready when he comes. The boy, Taharka, stood ankle deep in the thick black mud of the great river. It was hot, hot, hot. Not far away, across the lush green banks, the sun shimmered on sand and rock. The boy's skin, black as the rocks on the bank of the Nile, was protected by a loose white cloth that beat back the wicked rays. Already it was soaked with sweat. He's slow. He's lazy, said the boy, though his heart was beating fast. Don't count on it. He can move like the rapids downstream, and you won't hear a sound. For the first time in his twelve years, Taharka had been brought out on a crocodile hunt. The crocodile was sacred to Sebek, the crocodile god, of course, but that was all right, for, Tuk for Taharka was a prince. Not a very important prince, but a prince, one of the many sons of Shabaka, king of Cush, who ruled as a god in the Cushite city of Napata. He had no quarrel with Sebek. He had been taught that all the gods were his cousins, and he was not really looking forward to the killing. But Imbuta had said it was a lesson, something that must be learned. Don't play games, said Imbuta grimly. This isn't the day for it. Imbuta was his uncle, once a slave, now a high captain in the army. Taharka had always followed his orders without question. So now, heat or no heat, he got back in the boat. He leaned back to gaze at the shimmering blue sky at the water birds passing overhead. 
a flock of storks beat up by, uh, from the river, um, by, <laughs> I messed that up. A flock of storks beat by upriver from the great sea of the north, so far away that he did not believe it really existed, though his own grandfather had once seen it. He bowed his head in respect as the sacred ibis skimmed majestically by. Look, said Imbuta. Taharka's heart jumped, for he thought that the crocodile had come, but it was the kingfisher hovering still as death above them. It dove as he watched, plummeting down like a rock from the sky. The three of them, Taharka, Imbuta, and the net, the boatman, uh, watched spellbound, as if it had been the first time they had seen it. So, they did not realize that the crocodile was really there. He had come swiftly, as Imbuta had warned, only his dark green back showing above the water. He was very hungry and very silent, and the first they knew of his presence was the shock to the boat as he struck it with his tremendous tail. And then the scream, a heart-chilling scream, despairing, wild. Net, the boatman, had fallen into the water. Taharka had once seen a condemned criminal thrown to the crocodile. He had often dreamt of it. But this was real. This was Net. There was only one thing to do. He scrambled to the spot from which Net had fallen, seizing the spear with its iron head. Imbuta was shouting at him, No, no, Lord, no, let him go, get back. Sebek was already upon the boatman. Those terrible teeth were closing on his arm. Taharka struck the beast with the spear and, at the same time, saw the water redden with blood. Nets or the crocodiles, he didn't know which. But the flat head was driven aside, and suddenly Sebek had turned on him. The great jaws opened wide as in his dreams, ready to seize and crush him and drag him down. Something struck him and threw him flat. The jaws had snapped shut, but on the empty air. And Buta was leaning over the side, his powerful hands clamped around the ugly snout, squeezing it shut. The spear! The spear! Remember what I taught you! His great muscles were trembling. The sweat was pouring down his arms. Suddenly, Taharka was very calm. He grasped the spear, positioning his hands just as Mbuta had shown him. He fixed his eyes on the thrashing back of the beast, on the spot where the spear must enter at the base of the ugly head. He drove down the spear. The waters churned. There was a great cry from Imbuta thrown back into the bottom of the boat. Then the waters were dyed red as Taharka had never imagined and began to grow still. They dragged the boatman over the side. Blood was spurting from an ugly wound in his arm where the beast's teeth had grazed him. He was trembling with pain and shock. Taharka could see that the man might bleed to death. He knew little of what must be done. All the children of the god were instructed in the sacred medicine at their scribe school, the formulas, the prescriptions, the magic spells. The bleeding must be stopped with a tight binding above the wound. I can stop the bleeding, Taharka said. How? We have no cloth, said Imbuta. Without thinking, Taharka tore off the fine cotton cloth, the sacred cloth, so it was said, that shielded him from the sun. He looked defiantly at Imbuta. Imbuta was silent. Taharka hesitated, holding it out to the aging warrior, for Imbuta had staunched the blood of many battle wounds. Imbuta shook his head. Try your skill, he said. You've come this far. Finish it. Taharka gritted his teeth. He was frightened. The man's life might depend on what he did. He grasped the wounded arm, feeling for the spot where the terrible spurting must be stopped. And suddenly, he was no longer afraid. He could do it. Blood was life, but after all, it was only blood, and 
If you stopped the leak, it couldn't get out. It must be tight enough. He needed something to twist with. He broke off a stalk of reed. He knitted, uh, knotted the cloth in place. The man lay in the boat, still shaking and moaning. Now that it was over, Taharka found that he was shaking too. But somehow, he had never felt better in his life. Imbuta examined the dressing. It will hold. It wasn't as bad as I thought. They were no longer alone. Several of the small reed boats had pulled up close, drawn by the shouts and the cries, men with nets and wooden spears hunting for waterfowl. They stared at the boy with the emblems of the royal clan of Napata on his thin breast. They whispered together. Ambuta pointed one of them out. You! He nodded toward the injured boatman. Take his place! The fowler, without question, scrambled over the side. Away! And Buta shouted at the others. What are you looking at? How dare you lift your eyes to a son of the god? As they pulled away, Taharka heard one of them mutter, A son of the god! He has broken the taboo! He has laid hands on a slave! He has bound his wound with the sacred cloth! Under the burning sun, Taharka felt suddenly cold. The taboo, the law. His flesh was not mortal flesh, he had been taught. His very clothing must not be defiled. He had forgotten about that. What would they do to him when they found out? But he knew that even if there had been time to think, he would have done the same. I had to do it, he said to Ambuta. I know. And you being you, I couldn't have stopped you. Hold your head up and be ready for punishment if it comes. Don't think about it now. And on the way back to the city, he tried not to think about it. Tried to think about the approach to Napata, which he loved, with its great temple and towering tombs. The air had already begun to hum with voices. The scattered huts along the river bank thickened into clusters stretching as far as he could see. After a while, they came to a quay, and the fowler moored the boat. A chariot was waiting, the driver standing patiently beside it. Behind him stood another man with the solemn, self-important air of an official. But Taharka thought that he looked anxious, maybe even a little frightened. He waited while Imbuta ordered a longshoreman to take the injured boatman to one of the huts. Then he spoke. The Lord Taharka is commanded to appear at once in the hall of the god. For a moment, Taharka couldn't move. Had they found out about the sacred cloth already? But the man spoke again. All of the children of the great house are summoned. The god is dying. That concludes chapter one. Chapter 2. Death of a God Taharka thought he could count on his fingers the number of times he had seen his father, though he had sometimes felt his eyes upon him, heard something almost like a chuckle in the awesome figure as he passed him in its gold-washed litter, borne on the backs of four strong men. The God had many wives and a great many children. Some were important because their mothers were princesses. Taharka's mother was not, though, of course, the priests had made her one when the god had chosen her. She was just a girl who had been brought with the other slaves in a cargo of gold up the far, from the far-off Zambesi River. She had died some years before, and Imbuta, her brother, was all that Taharka had left of her. So Taharka was not one of the important children of the god, but they all played together and learned together in the women's quarters learned reading and writing, languages and dancing, magic and healing, and the many, many laws and taboos of the Kush, and above all, the lore of the gods, their cousins. Today, Taharka was not taken back to the house of the women. Just as he was, looking like a boatsman's boy, he was brought into the gods' great chamber to see his father die. 
The sweat on his face was cold now as he joined the throng of children. Brothers, sisters, cousins of all degrees, some of them shivering with fear, some giggling softly in nervous excitement. His cousin, Shepnuset, was there, bad little Shepnuset, who had stolen a lamb from the kitchen. They had been keeping a close watch on her since the day another cousin, whose mind had not grown with his body, had reached out, smiling, to touch a poisonous ass. Shepnuset, attacking the creature with a stick, had almost gotten herself killed. That would have been a disaster, for Shepnuset was the niece and destined heir of Taharka's great aunt, the high priestess of Ammon, who ruled as the god's deputy for Egypt and far-off Thebes. She would one day be almost more sacred than the king himself. Taharka liked to look at her. Even today, he could not help looking at her, though the other children whispered that she was really not that pretty. It was on the day of killing the asp that he had decided that marriage might not be so bad after all. Of course, there was no question of marrying Shepneset. She was destined for his half-brother, Shabataka. That, he thought, was as it should be. Shabataka, 16 years old, tall, strong, grave, and handsome. After today, the god. There was no doubt about that. The priests had prepared for it for years. Only Shabataka could really be said to know his father. Only Shabataka was allowed to slip into his presence unannounced. Only Shabataka could stand at his side, listening and learning, while the Lord of Cush gave audience. Taharka's reverence for his older brother was second only to his reverence for the god himself. What must Shabataka be feeling now, he wondered. Grief, certainly. The god himself was not seated on the golden stool as Taharka had always seen him before. His cedar wood couch had been carried into the great hall. He lay upon it, propped up on cushions, his breath faint, his clouded eyes wandering over the faces of priests, magicians, and captains, and the many wives and children. Why are they here? he whispered. Must I give a judgment? The priest of Sebek the crocodile was on his knees beside the couch. Yes, a judgment, great God. The time has come. You must take the wand of succession in your hand. You must declare your choice. My sons, said the God, Shabak, um, Shabaka, bring them to me. Be Anki, Shabataka, Kashta, Taharka. Taharka, no, said the crocodile priest. He raised his head from the ground and spoke so all could hear him. The Lord Taharka has broken a taboo. He has touched the flesh of a slave. His godhood is sullied. We will pass judgment on him later. Taharka could not have moved. They knew. How had they known so quickly? It didn't matter. They knew. The God was speaking. His voice was stronger. We will pass judgment. I am the God on earth. I will pass judgment. Taharka, my son, seed of my father, Pianki, seed of my father, Kashta the king, come to me. On his knees and elbows, Taharka crawled the length of the stone floor to his father's couch. The God's voice was weaker now. Why have you done this thing? Taharka raised his head. The man would have died. He whispered it. Though it was forbidden to look into the god's eyes, Taharka knew that through the mist of weakness and pain, they were as hard as the black rock of the holy mountain. In terror, he searched for words that the god would understand. Suddenly, he found them. He straightened on his knees, and his voice rang out as firmly as the voice of the priest of Sebek. The man belonged to the god, 
Everything belongs to the God, the water of the river, the grain in the fields, the laborers and priests and chieftains of the land. I, too, am the slave of the God. I must preserve what belongs to you, great God, Shabaka. The great God, Shabaka, fell back upon his cushion. A groan of dismay ran around the chamber. If the dying man had used up his strength on this trifling matter, what would become of the succession? Would the land be left without a god on earth to bring the rising of the sun and the flooding of the river and the growth of the grain? But the god had raised a trembling hand. The priest of the sun in Napata hastened to place within it the wand of gold, the magic wand of succession, the scepter of the god. The wand wavered a moment, then fell. Its tip pointed toward the boy kneeling beside the couch. There was a long moment's silence. The figure on the couch did not move. At last, the priest of the sun broke the silence. The great God, he said, has become one with his father. See, the wand of succession, it has declared his choice. The priests, the warriors, the many wives and children fell upon their knees, foreheads pressed to the cold floor of the chamber. Taharka heard again the voice of the sun priest. Taharka, child of the god, arise. He was trembling. What did it mean? What had happened? Was he to be punished now? His hands were being crossed upon his breast. Something cold and smooth was being pressed into them. It was the golden wand of the god. Take possession of the land, Taharka, soul of the hawk, beautiful child of Ra, son of the sun, bringer of the Nile, lord of Cush, great god of Napata and Mero and Pharaoh of Egypt. Taharka had become a god. He had also received his punishment. End of chapter 2.